Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Plenary 5, Inclusive and Equitable Engagement in Basic Science. We're going to use this session to explore what inclusive, equitable engagement looks like, what are some of the things that get in our way, and how we can do better as both individuals and institutions. We'll also talk about, because we have a long way to go, how we can find joy along the way. Our panelists today are Dr. Monica Feyu Mujer, who is the Director of Communications for Ciencia Puerto Rico and the Director for iBiology, Dr. Baranda Montgomery from Michigan State University, the Michigan State University Foundation Professor and Interim Vice President for Research and Innovation, Dr. Edna Tan, who's a Professor of Science Education at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and Dr. Kyle White, who's the George Willis Pack Professor of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan. I had a chance to talk to all of these folks ahead of the session and it was an amazing conversation. You're in for a treat. They speak from a place of grace and humility and with the weight of experience, insight and commitment. They're courageous and they're willing to name uncomfortable truths like the history and persistence of racism and colonialism in the ways we do science. If you feel uncomfortable, I'd ask you to embrace it, to lean into it. Let's all lean into this being uncomfortable as an opportunity because as the panelists told me, being uncomfortable is an opportunity for growth. As I said, it was a really amazing conversation and I'm excited that, that, that we have the opportunity to continue it. And I wanted to invite you all into that conversation as well. So please use the Q&A button to add your questions to the queue. And don't worry too much if they show up as answered, that's a behind the scenes thing. What answered means is they're in the queue for, um, for being addressed by the panelists. And with that, Let's get started. Um, Monica, I want to start with you, if I can. Can you share an example of what inclusive science engagement looks like that you've been involved with? Okay, my mic is on now. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Raj, and, and thank you everyone for, for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited for this conversation. Raj, I think you should be turning your camera on just like I should have turned my mic on. Um, for me, it, it means um, equitable engagement in, in basic science means partnership. Um, and, and I talk about partnership because in, in terms of engagement, you know, there are, there are several things that need to happen. You need to have empathy. Um, you need to, you know, be able to understand um, your, your partner or partners. Um, you need to also be able to leverage strengths, um, be aware about the strengths that everyone brings to the table. Um, you know, for me, engagement means that everybody can bring their whole selves to the table and their, their culture, their background, their life experiences. Um, and so for me, when I think about engagement, um, I think about, about partnership. Thanks. Um, Baranda, what would you add? I would challenge us to, to even think about what inclusion means. Um, I think too frequently the people who are at the table first, uh, because the table was built for them or the table invited them first, believe that inclusion is about them inviting people into their thoughts and ideas. Um, and inclusion is about realizing that sometimes the table has to be reformulated. And it's not about inviting people to add their ideas as layering onto a system that's already in place, but actually questioning the composition of the table itself, even as we're questioning the composition of people who are at the table. That's wonderful. Thank you. Edna, can you help us? Can you continue? Sure. Um, and I, I will build on what Veronda just said. So the whole idea of inclusivity, I think, is something that um, we should trouble because in inclusivity gives the idea that are set and established and, and the host right the people who have been the ones who who run the show are extending an invitation to people who have not been invited to whatever is happening right now and and in our case it is basic science i will also throw out a question that we need to define and operationalize what exactly is basic science and who has been the people who have defined it historically and so if um 
if we think about why is it that we are in a state where we have to talk about inclusion and equity, right? It is because there is injustice. It is because there have been inequities. And so, you know, we should, we should try to probe deeper to figure out the root of the issue. So why is it that historically um, groups of people, specific groups of people have been denied entry into the enterprise of science, you know, before we can sort of put forth a solution to say, oh, here's where we are at. Let's figure out how to, you know, just put a put a bandaid or a plaster where we, where, which is what I say, where we come from, you know, without looking at at the wounds, the deep wounds, and so so I would trouble the notion that we need to go far upstream um, about why is it that we are even here talking about injustice and and that the fact that we have to include people who have been excluded. Thank you, um, Kyle. Yeah, I really want to uplift the projects that you know I've been privileged to be part of that emanate from tribal colleges and universities. You know, I'm a member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation and for Potawatomi and other Anishinaabe people, I mean the the notion of like basic science just sounds kind of bizarre to us because the institutions that use that that term they they haven't uh, done much effort to uh, uh, to have native people as part of those institutions and you know back in the day we had our own scientific and knowledge institutions our own educational institutions we had our own way of thinking about knowledge and epistemology and so we're trying to rebuild those institutions in ways that make sense to our communities and so you know tribal colleges and universities are providing experiences for a number of native persons to be able to study and learn within their own communities, pursue uh, knowledge and scientific uh, careers within tribal nations. Uh, and so for a decade, I've worked with the Sustainable Development Institute at the College of Menominee Nation in numerous programs that are really trying to recenter uh, tribal nations and indigenous people uh, so that we can pursue science and knowledge that we trust and that we find reliable for our self-determination and sovereignty. Thanks, Kyle. I'd love to ask more about that tension between kind of um, including people in an institution that's already pretty far along a path and building or supporting the building of alternate institutions. How do you all think about that? And Edna, maybe starting with you, because you kind of introduced the idea of, of really questioning what we mean by inclusion. So I think about it um, as as the necessity to to trouble existing structures, right? So the whole infrastructure of of science, um, of Western schooling, I will I will put that into um, the ecosystem of of how one would think that one positions out oneself in science and what one wants to wants to do about science. The whole infrastructure of schooling, of science, of higher education, of which you know we all complicit are uh, built on white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. And so these norms and practices are historical. They are established from that, you know, that positionality and built in to reproduce these norms. And therefore, when we're thinking about people who do not, who are not, you know, white middle class or heterosexual or any other mainstream identifiers that the general public is, you know, somewhat com more comfortable with, then we are essentially asking um, particular people to deny an aspect of themselves in exchange for the privilege, right, or the invitation to participate in in basic science, and is it is that is that an equitable thing to do? conjecture? Not that 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 is not something that um, I would be willing to do, and I would venture to say that's not something anyone would be willing to do to deny an a salient aspect of the of themselves, you know, in order to participate in. The scientific enterprise and it shouldn't be that way and so if that is an enduring issue then to me any kind of um you know activities that we might we might suggest that doesn't trouble the basic reproduction of those kinds of norms and injustices that only favor and work for a particular group of people is not going to work thanks i'm i'm, I'm curious if, if you could help us understand a little bit what that um, what that might feel like or look like. What what does it look like to to have your place in science questioned? Um, 
Do you have some so I work, examples uh, yeah. of what white supremacy yes. looks like, I guess is what I'm asking. Right. So I work mostly with youth of color, um, generational poverty and recently resettled refugee youth, you know, in the middle school and sometimes with their teachers in the schools, the informal settings and formal settings. And the the wisdom that the young people have is, is amazing. And they they will say, you know, they will they will articulate and say, um, why should I participate in science class when I am invisible to my teacher? And then there's this quote that sticks with me, a young um, black girl who said, you know, when I walk into science class, I know I'm, I'm not wanted. I know I, I'm not wanted, right? And, and this is, this is what, 2019, right? Before COVID hit. Um, and so young people know uh, instinctively there is this, you know, Sarah and Ahmed writes about atmospheric walls. They need not be walls of material, materiality or brick and mortar, but they are immaterial walls with very material effects. And they tell particular students whether they are welcome or whether they belong in science or whether they have a voice in science. Um, another uh, incident that sticks in my head is we working with a group of black youth and after school program, you know, learning about a carbon footprint, what does it mean to be to take care of the planet and why we should bother and why we should care. And the young people were saying, look, we are looking for pictures and, uh, and examples of how everyday uh, recycling can take place and you cannot find one black person in all the images that we have looked for. It is always a white man who looks middle class, who is recycling. And it is not that we don't want to recycle. So why is it that we're not represented? Uh, and then they bring out the issue that, you know, we live in apartments that do not have, you know, city provided recycling um, receptacles that we can just throw our stuff in and then the city comes and carts it away. You know, if we have to want to recycle, we have to collect our stuff, bring it to some recycling center, which is really far away. And we don't have the transportation to do that. So on the face, right, you can say, oh, therefore your household does not recycle, therefore, you know, this is something that you should do. But the young people are saying that there are layers upon layers of barriers that prevent us from doing what we know and we, that we want to do. And when we look for representation, we find none. And then you ask us the question, why is it that we, what, why do we not care about the environment? So they are really nuanced and, and complex in their understanding of a, a, a simple issue. We can call it a simple issue, whether one should reduce, reuse and recycle. But they're bringing in their embodied experiences of you know, historical injustices that intersect and permeate one's everyday life, you know, in which recycling is nested and has to take place. Thank you. Um, wondering if other panelists want to weigh in on this question. I think there's, you know, a profound tension when thinking about the issue of diversity and inclusion and basic science. So in terms of uh, Native people in the context of the United States, you know, so first off, you know, Native people are citizens of the, the United States and have every right <laughs> as a, a citizen to be uh, treated well and to not face discrimination within any institution uh, within the United States. But for, for, for most Indigenous persons, they're actually more primarily, including in a legal sense, but they're more primarily a member of their tribal nation, a citizen of their tribal nation. And, you know, it could very well be the case that if we lived in a lot better of a world, there still would not be a lot of Native people in, in basic science because we would have our own institutions that were thriving and operating well, and that's where we would be uh, employed at. <laughs> that's where we would uh, pursue our careers. And so I think it can be challenging sometimes for people to balance the, the, the tensions between the idea that yes, the, the current institutions as they are, are deeply problematic in terms of inclusion uh, and equity, uh, but actually one of the best paths forward is for indigenous people, but this can be uh, uh, in, in light of other communities too, to develop their own self-determination, their own uh, yeah, epistemological sovereignty. I also, please. oh, sorry, I was gonna no, jump. No, please go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to, to return, you know, you asked whether we need new structures um, and I, I believe in just being transparent. I think we do need new, new structures. I think we need new practices 
But I'm also very cognizant that we have to exist in some way in the structures that we have while we build um, and reformulate structures. And I think sometimes that's the challenge. And as you know, as a plant biologist, I often come to this work thinking about um, how we get to that through things that we understand about the natural world. And one of the things that we really understand about natural ecosystems is that if you have a stable ecosystem, there has to be some disruption to get a different composition of that ecosystem. And these are used in nat natural, you know, nat natural practices of managing ecosystems that sometimes you have to interrupt disruptions. You have to remove some of the individuals that are there if you wanna make space for others to come in. And I think that although we understand these, in the importance of intentional disruptions, of natural cycles of disruptions in our ecosystems naturally, we resist that idea in terms of our institutions. And I think we have to embrace the fact that if we're going to get to these espoused um, places of equity and diversity that we claim to want, we can't resist natural practices, which means there have to be some intentional disruptions. And somehow we want to change system without disrupting the one that we have. And that works nowhere else on the planet nowhere else in this whole you know, world, and yet that's what we want. And I think we have to start to really embrace the fact that either we're going to just espouse our need for change or we're going to embrace it and understand that there's going to be some discomfort in terms of the disruptions we have to have in leadership of the structures, in the actual structures themselves. And we have to trust the process that although we don't know what's ahead of us, it may be much greater. And in fact, I argue it is much greater than what we have. And we can't hold on to what we have and want change. It doesn't work anywhere in the globe. Yeah, and to add to what Veranda is saying, I mean, it's this is making me think about something um, my team at Ciencia Puerto Rico and I, we talk a lot about being rebels with strategy. Um, and so I we think a lot about um, you know, we have to exist in, in these imperfect systems and um, there, we need to, uh, to push change forward. But sometimes what needs to happen is you need to be part of the system, understand how it works deeply and then hack it, um, figure out how it works so that you can hack it and you can change it. And so, um, you know, there's, I think there's that individual strategic work that needs to happen. But I think something that we have to pay attention to is not put the burden just on the individual, particularly marginalized individuals. When it comes to dismantling injustices and, and inequity, the burden often is often put on people who are already marginalized. And if marginalized people were able to easily dismantle their own oppression, they would have done it already. Um, so I think we have to think about, but we have to stop actually trying to fix individuals and we have to think about systems. How do we um, how do we change systems and not just focusing on individuals? So that actually tees up a question from Sir Khan, which I think we're, we're sort of teasing around. So in a short answer, that the, the, the question is, should we reset the proverbial table or should we start all over again with a fresh table? And I think I guess what I'm hearing from you is a little bit of both. We need to be resetting the table, um, but we need to exist on the tables that exist now at the same time. Is that is that a fair summary of what you've all said? I think it's fair. And as you were saying it, you know, one of the principles by which I work is that occasionally tables need to be completely overturned, but I have to able to be in position to understand its weight, the physics of it, and the best way to overturn it. So sometimes I've got to get to the table and understand the table to be in position if it needs to be completely overturned. And I think that's part of what Monica was saying is that to, to really reformulate or replace a system, you have to understand it. And I think that, you know, to Monica's point, we've often put it on the individual. Um, I have had success in the academy because I am a system analyst as an individual. But then we have to ask, are we going to bring those system analysts into positions of having access to resources and power to change the system or just to navigate as individuals? And I think we really have to get to the table, understand that table, and really be in a position to overturn it. Yeah, I appreciate it. So to follow, sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Oh, just super briefly, I appreciate uh, 
Veranda's points, and one thing I would just uh, uh, say, building on that, is you know we, we do need a culture that when those of us engage in some of these dominant institutions and these tables, uh, you know it, it shouldn't be a cost that we have to bear that we're expected to subscribe <laughs> to any of the values or the the traditions of those institutions. And so I find it really powerful when there are environments where colleagues can can be at that table and can be doing exactly what Bronda described, but there's no expectation that I have to buy into uh, anything that is false, that's problematic, that's that's abusive. Right, to extend the metaphor of the table further, right? And Veronda said you overturn a table. It's like sometimes, is it even a table? Sometimes it's a mat that's on the ground and you sit cross-legged around it. And where is the table, right? A lot of times when you think about table, we think about a hierarchically organized ecosystems where people come to the university or come to established institutions of science where the important discourses happen. But I would argue that the table needs to move. Sometimes it's a mat, you know, in the forest or in other spaces where people live and are part of the phenomenon that, that we have to you know, understand and probe deeper. Going back to Veronda's point about we need to suspend our, we need to be okay with being uncomfortable and we need to be okay with just you know being murky because what we are imagining and, and the social futures we're imagining uh, is something that has never been because you know historically it has been the white supremacist canon that has run the show and so you know not just about the table but, but where the table should be should it even be a table where should we go right who should we talk to and so then the other um the other threat is that there is systemic injustices in science. There, it is systemic because it is historical it is enduring and it is widespread it is not systemic in the sense that it is the same, right? That it is homogenous. Oppression operates in very local, very specific ways, targeting very specific people. So in order to understand oppression, like bringing back to, I'm trying to connect back to Carl's point about, you know, researchers and, and people who do this work, we have to go to the trenches, so to speak. We have to be there on the ground to figure out what is going on. And a lot of times in academia, those kind of work take a long time. And then you have the other, you know, monster of publish or perish. And we are thinking about building up, you know, new scholars who will take up this really difficult, you know, and the brunt of this kind of justice oriented work. So not just about science, but the whole enterprise of academia and how we support, you know, promote um, what counts as good scholarly science in promoting justice in scientific engagement has also to be part of the conversation. Monica, do you want to weigh in? Um, I'll weigh in and actually I, I saw, I see a question from Bruce Lewinstein and I, I want to kind of extend this, con continue extending this conversation about um, the, the table and just talk about how people might do that. I'm a, I'm a practitioner and so I like to think about concrete ways to do things. And um, from my own work, I've been for the past uh, year almost, I've been leading a, a COVID-19 prevention project um, that's mainly focused on education and capacity building in marginalized communities in, in Puerto Rico. And what we have done is, I think we've done two things. We have moved the table, we are taking the table on the road, um, and we're finding new uses for the table, in this case, the table being to, be, to put science in service of these communities so they can use it to, to protect themselves um, from, from COVID-19. And so one of the things that we have done is that we have we haven't just brought in communities, but we're going to, we're meeting them where they are. Um, we are working very hard to understand what are they doing already? Because many communities, even though they don't think about science, academia certainly doesn't recognize it as science, as science are fundamentally doing science. They're using the knowledge that they have about the natural world, the needs that they have, um, and they're making things happen with it. Um, and so we are working with these communities to um, to support them in terms of providing them educational resources, um, helping them be more effective 
in, in communicating. And I think the key thing with this has been one, our own awareness as a team that these communities are already doing things, that communities know what they need and that what our role is, is to come in as, as partners, to put our knowledge in service and partner our knowledge with theirs um, to make things, things happen in this case, protect them from COVID-19. And then the other thing that we're doing is, you know, I think a lot about meals and, and I'm from Puerto Rico and, um, you know, food is, is really important. Family and community is really important. And so what we're doing is we're breaking bread um, with, with these people. We're, we're sharing not meals, but knowledge with these people around, you know, around this table so that um, we can, we can try to, to address some of the, the injustices that, that these communities have historically faced and are facing during, during this pandemic. Thanks. Um, let's continue on that thread of the concrete things. Um, what are some of the other concrete things that someone can do if they wanna start to, in their work as a scientist, dismantle some of these, um, as an individual, what can they do to counter these oppressive tendencies of science, if you will? I think there absolutely needs to be a, a required philosophical reflection. And I, I just wanted to build a bit on what Monica had shared. You know, there's no philosophical way to separate conclusively basic from applied. Um, because if you categorize them in a certain way, you know, in, in each case, you have different research conditions, different communities involved, different funding mechanisms. What makes one basic and one <laughs> not basic or, or, or applied? And, you know, I think it's important to understand that if you can't conclusively and philosophically separate them out, then what is the, the demarcation actually serving? And another related issue is that in a lot of the fairly dominant, you know, scientific traditions within the US, like the one at the the ones at the university that 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 I work at, you know, there really is a hang up about talking about the way in which values and money and political influence affects research questions, affects research practices. And that sort of aversion to having that conversation in a non-defensive way is is deeply problematic. And for a lot of indigenous knowledge systems, uh, they've oftentimes been pitted against other types of science, like which one has the best knowledge. But when I really think of the differences, I really think that indigenous knowledge systems and scientific systems uh, are primarily different because they don't have a hang up with the idea that values, politics, and money is part of uh, epistemic inquiry, is, is, is part of knowledge. And instead of trying to shield or kind of, you know, be defensive about it or, or deny it. Uh, rather, indigenous people seek to find the best ways to, uh, uh, to understand uh, good and bad forms of influence of, of values and politics and, and money, and to really take on that idea that they can't be avoided. And through understanding uh, ethical qualities like consent and reciprocity and trust and accountability, perhaps we can then uh, create institutions that serve our communities, that serve our peoples, and serve others as well. Thanks. So, I mean, this is great. I'm hearing a lot of concrete suggestions. Show up, listen, bring food, uh, have food, um, question your basic assumptions that you're bringing to the table, like the assumption that there's something called basic and applied, or that the uh, science we do is un independent from the social context in which it occurs, from things like money and and interest have fundamental respect for the knowledge that people bring to the table outside of the science community. Don't imagine that the only place knowledge resides is science. What else? What other things should researchers I, be doing? I think we have to um, identify a platform and protect truth tellers. Um, and I think that we live with too many fallacies um, in science and higher ed. And you know, part of the I was looking at some some things in the comments about the fact that there's some tension between the conversation we're having and the pace of change in academia, and that we're talking about things that sometimes seem like long scale change and how do we stay committed. And one of the things, the truths that has emerged for me um, over the past year um, in terms of how universities responded to the pandemic 
is that we buy into the idea that things are slow in the in academia when they don't have to be. We saw a lot of things happen very quickly last March and April. We saw classes go online within a week to 10 days. When usually people say, you know, those are curricular changes that has to go through committees and it has to take time. So what I realized is that the pace of change in academia is slow because we believe it's slow. And when we believe that there is an urgency, uh, when we believe that something is absolutely critical to our existence to continue in academia, we can make it happen fast. So it was urgent for classes to get online because we would not be able to keep tuition. We would not be able to keep things going if we didn't get those classes online. Because it was essential for us to get classes online, we flipped to classes online in seven to 10 days. And that caused me to start to ask the question, what would happen if we felt a similar urgency and essentiality around diversity, equity, and inclusion? Would we start to see our budgets change? Would we start to see decisions change? And so if for me, I started to tell the truth that we haven't seen some change because we don't see it as, as critical to our existence um, in academia. And when we see it as critical to our existence, things will change. And so I think we have to have truth tellers. Um, we have to protect truth tellers because what often happens with truth tellers is that they get shut down, they get marginalized and they get deplatformed. And so I think that there is, you know, in the midst of everything else that we said, we have to be willing to platform, confront and respond to truth um, in terms of why we are the way we are. That sounds like I'm going to I want to. Oh, sorry. I wanted no, to build up on that. I, I yeah. love this idea of protecting truth tellers and it, it connects with what I was thinking. And you know, I often talk about leveraging privilege and I see comments and questions about especially you know how do I as a you know cis male white person um help you know how can I be an ally or how can I be um you know how can I contribute to this and you know think about your privilege um and we all have privileges some more than others but you know if you are a white man um you are you have inerrant privileges just because you exist the way you are um so think about how do you leverage that privilege to protect truth tellers how do you leverage that privilege to help um you know somebody doing great work get get funding um how do you use that privilege to move um the conversation to affect that change you know i often i'm i'm a i'm puerto rican you know, I'm a Latina woman, but if I enter a space, I pass as white and I know that gives me privilege. So I'm constantly thinking about how do you, I use the privilege and the spaces that I occupy to advance, um, to advance equity. Sometimes leveraging that privilege means you do something and you just get out of the way or you take a seat, sit and just listen. Um, so think about, think deeply about how do you leverage your privilege? And if thinking about the privileges that you have makes you uncomfortable, great. Sit with that discomfort and think about what does it make me uncomfortable? Like, why does it, what does it say about the system that because just because of how I look or how I speak or where I was born, I'm able to do certain things and others don't. Because um, as you mentioned at the beginning, Raj, that, that discomfort is where growth starts happening. So at, you know, um, think about, do you have skin in the game and what does that mean? You know, and going back to what Baronda said about COVID was the great leveler, right? COVID doesn't care what skin color you're in or what, how much income you have. And so everybody in the university has skin in the game because all our lives are being upended and therefore the, the change was quick. Now, when you do not have skin in the game, right? And you think talking about equity, thinking about in inclusion very much falls into the trope of charity. And, and that is wrong. Equity is not charity. You know, writing injustices is, is more imperative. It is not charity. And so thinking about where you stand and whether you have skin in the game is something that is important. Thank you. Kyle? Uh, I, I'm good since I had shared a bit earlier on the same point. Great. I'm, I'm curious about how we think about um, the next generation and kind of the supports and the and the strategies we can build both um, it, it, it systemically and also in your individual work. How do you support the next generation in this? And maybe, Baranda, I'll start with you because you've talked a lot about how you've learned from plants. 
to think about this differently? Yes. Um, well, I, you know, I think about the next generation as not even so much how I can support them, but how we can exist in reciprocity. Uh, because my work is enabled by being in multi-generational learning and supportive communities. And so whereas certainly I do sit at a place of having a career stability and privilege to support and protect them, and I try to do that when I can. And sometimes that's by calling a thing a thing. You know, uh, this week I've been involved in a movement, Black Botanist Week, and in bringing some attention to some of these young Black botanists, they're being invited to give talks about their experience being Black in science. And I've challenged that. They are scientists. Invite them to talk about their science. We know that that's what's going to position them to have success in the future. So I think in being in multi-generational communities, we can speak up where we have earned privilege to protect them. But I also have to learn from them. And they have, um, it's, a, it's a, a relationship of reciprocity. And I never want to get in the place of thinking that I am supporting and platforming young people because then it seems like I'm getting in that position of, of white supremacy and, and patriarchy, that I'm the one who holds something that I can give them access to. But it is about asking in the community who has access to what, who has what skills, who has what strengths, and how do we each bring those to fore so that the entire community can be successful. So I like to think about it as reciprocity, using what I have, but also drawing on them when they're the ones who have something, because we exist and survive together. If I'm the only one who's surviving, I've done no service. And so I really do try to think about it as a collective, as reciprocity, and how we all bring our gifts, skills, and privilege to the table uh, to sustain us as a community. There is a profound theme of sort of mutual respect and collaboration running through all of your remarks. And I guess I, I want to jump all the way back to one of the first questions that came up, which was kind of the, the link between the process of science and the culture of science and how you see that playing out in terms of these issues. I mean, I think they're, they're hard to separate, right? Like the culture of, of science, um, it's, it's, it's white supremacy. It's, it's, it's Western. And, and so, and, and so the process of science, what we think of as, you know, this systematic pursuit of quote unquote truth is based on, on what the culture of science says, or like what culture period says science is. And so I, it's, it's hard to separate them. Um, but, you know, I often think about some of the issues that I'm trying to tackle in 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 science, and the reality is like the, they are issues in in society. Um, so it's you have to think, like Brana said earlier, you have to think about systems and how they are connected. And so for me, trying or you know working to dismantle the the historical injustices and the persistent injustices in science is also about dismantling injustices in our in our society so um you know i i, I don't think about it I think about it in as a system and so how do i what i'm doing here in um, in science and in more particularly in science communication and engagement, how does that dismantle injustices um, everywhere? And so I think that awareness of, of how the culture of science impacts in the culture of just society, how Western society works, impacts the process of science. Is, I think it's, it's really, really important because it, it tells us how deep these issues are um, and, and for me, at least it guides, you know, where do I start and where do I focus my, my energy? Cause, um, you know, I, I have limited time and, and energy. One of the things that, you know, regarding the culture and processes of science that, you know, I think those of us who are fairly entrenched in some of these dominant institutions can do for the next generation is to really model what it means to stand up to abusive culture. You know, I, I've been at, you know, two different research institutions that, you know, had just levels of abusiveness and, uh, you know, that rival the worst institutions in the world that we could ever imagine. And, you know, today, uh, we're still operating in a 
research and scientific climate that actually protects people who are abusive to others. Uh, and we still have many colleagues that on the one hand, they espouse certain values and ideas, but when they're actually uh, in the position to, to lead and to stand up, they, they don't. And they do things that protect those that are abusive. And that abuse is something that has denigrated people of color, indigenous people in particular, has made it so that people don't continue in their trajectories within higher education, within research and within related types of institutions. And it, it, it is time to model what it means to stand up and to not tolerate the inadequacies of the policies and the behaviors that, that feed into this deeply abusive culture. Thank you. Edna, do you want to Thank jump you. in? Oh, sorry. Were you going to speak oh, yeah. Go ahead. You know, I was just thinking a lot about this culture and process because I, what I have come to understand since I've been in administration is that um, and also thinking about the work of people like Sarah Ahmed, you know, on being included and her new work on complaint. Process is often the way that we maintain status quo, even when we purport to be changing culture. And so I think a lot of times we focus on whether our cultures are, we're saying that they are what they are. And we think about climate, but we can't get distracted from this, the, the idea that sometimes process is where we're actually maintaining um, the status quo. And sometimes we just get caught up into the process as rote kinds of things that we do. But I've been questioning the ways we send out emails about things. You know, in some ways we send out emails to the same soup group of people that we always encounter when we have a new funding opportunity. That's maintaining status quo. We're not finding ways to equitably put this information out there. So I think process, sometimes we don't understand how we get caught up, you know, I was thinking about something you said earlier, Kyle, that we can be at the table without buying into the values. And I believe that wholeheartedly. But I've also asked the questions about how when I come to the table and I ask them, how are these things done? Am I being dragged into a process that the process itself is maintaining things that go against the values that I purport? So I look at process really carefully. And I often understand that the invitation to participate in a process is an invitation to distract me from pursuing my values. And so you really have to tear apart process and ask, is the process itself maintaining inertia? Is the process itself maintaining white supremacy and patriarchy? And I think we don't do that enough because we're out there saying, this is what I believe. These are my values. This is the culture I want. But I really tear apart every part of process because those processes are how we maintain actual status quo and inertia. That's a really interesting point, Baranda. It, it reminds me of stuff Kendi's written about how the process can sometimes lead or, or supersede the values. Um, Monica, you look like you want to weigh in. No. <laughs> oh, okay. My bad. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I, other than agreeing with Veranda, I don't know that I can say things as beautifully and poignantly as her. <laughs> There's a couple of questions showing up in the chat around. May I, may I weigh in a little Please. bit? Please, of course, Edna. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, so there, there's there is uh, lots of stuff going on in the chat, and I I also totally agree that, you know, the the language that we use is one place that we can start, right? So for me and my colleague, um, um, Angie Calabrese Barton and you, Mitch, like we have intentionally stopped using the word inclusivity, right? Equity as inclusion to us, you know, reproduces the norm and does not question the structure or the historical aspects of why, you know, we we still have these issues, and so. We've drawn from work on sanctuary cities and we, we want to talk about rightful presence. What does it mean for a young person of color to be rightfully present in science, in their everyday science learning and engagement? What does that mean um, in terms of shifting the culture of how science is done? So even when we think about culture, right, we talk about it as if it is so benign, as if like, oh, you know, different groups of people have different cultures and they're all like diversity, like difference is good, but we don't trouble the historical and the systemic injustices that that reproduce certain cultures that have particular 
people that are unjust. So, you know, even in a language that we use as, as um, scientists and academics who work in this world, it is really important to, to trouble that. And going back to the point of process that Baronda brought up, right? A lot of times oppression operates in mundanity. It's really mundane, small things that we don't think about. It doesn't have to be big dramatic actions, right? It is, it is like boiling a frog in water. And, and so the, the everyday mundane things that we do, if it, it positions as guests, right? That is, they can do something only if they behave well, then that is not equity. Right, that, that is still reproducing, entrenching power structures. Um, and, and we are just, you know, putting on a bandit and pretending that we are doing equity when we are really not. And the young people are smart. They see through immediately. I'm seeing nods on that point a lot. Um, I'm, maybe I'm just buying into a process. And so I'm a little reluctant to ask this question, but there's a lot of questions about basic and applied and Kyle, you, you posited, and, and I think this has been a theme through this conference that maybe that distinction isn't always useful. Is there anything you want to say about the particular, the particularity of what has been called basic science and what, um, a, what can we, is there anything particular about that that you want to call out in terms of this topic of, um, of building a more equitable and inclusive, and sorry for using that term, Edna, uh, science. <laughs> well, there, there is, um, you know, I know this works differently in a lot of different contexts, you know, but there are these, these hierarchies out there that feed uh, different people's own, you know, arrogance about their careers, which, you know, oftentimes, uh, leads them to be people who are abusive or just ineffective as uh, colleagues and as supporters of of diverse people. And you know, oftentimes, and again, I know it varies here and there, but oftentimes, basic science has a privileged position in some of these uh, career hierarchies in relation to applied or you know other conceptions of science, which are pitted uh, in in contrast to basic science and. You know, given how uh, much certain types of institutions of basic science operate with an ivory tower, it's it's really quite shocking to think that a hierarchy of success would have fairly high up that hierarchy what some people refer to as basic science, because it would mean that the, the more you advance on a certain ladder, the more you're engaged in activities that have the least community input, the least public involvement, and are oftentimes the most susceptible to uh, heavily biased and politically motivated and, you know, economically corrupt forms of funding. And, you know, I think that's fairly disturbing, right? Whereas somebody who operates in a, a different scientific context that's much more diverse, that's much more community engaged, would actually be considered to do work that is not uh, very high up on a certain career uh, hierarchy. And so in cases where basic science has a certain privilege within a certain assumption, uh, assumption of what uh, success looks like in the knowledge business, uh, that really needs to be uh, that really needs to be challenged, and those hierarchies need to be dismantled. We need to stop feeding the the types of egos that thrive off of that. <laughs> um, you know. Thank you. We have about a minute and thirty seconds left, and and this has been an um, a, an enormously like this has been a great. Thank you. Um, this has been awesome. Um, it, it also makes me think we got a long way to go. Um, what what do you what gives you hope on that journey? I will say what gives me hope is although we have a long way to go, we're moving. And movement as opposed to being static gives me hope, even when the movement isn't as rapid or in as straight of a direction as that I would as I would like it to go. And I think the fact that we're having this conversation and not afraid to call things things um, gives me hope, right? That we're willing to have the conversations that make us uncomfortable with the hope that we have to walk through that to get where we want to go. So not being static gives me hope, even when that can draw and I keep aspiring to it. Thank you. We cannot not I hope. Will act. We cannot not hope. That's that's all we have. That's all we have. And you know, if if we give up, then that's the end, right? So 
so whether something gives me hope and there are lots of things like young people this plenary gives me hope the conversation gives me hope but really you know it's either hope or accept defeat and i'm not ready to accept defeat in the interest of time i'll just plus one what veranda and and uh edna have said you know we are we see change. Um, sometimes when you're in the thick of it, it's hard to see change and movement happening. Um, but take a step back and, and, and see where we are, where we used to be. And um, the fact that there is change and, and young people, how bad young people want change and how they see things differently, that gives me hope. Um, I, I certainly agree and appreciate folks that make arguments, uh, you know, for hope and its importance. Uh, I also think that maybe um, there are better emotional responses than hope that are out there for us to <laughs> take seriously. Kyle, what would some of those be? Uh, carrying on the legacies of our communities and doing the needed actions that need to take place, whether they can be, their outcomes can be hoped for uh, or not. and recognizing that we're part of stories and narratives that go beyond us and that you know we need to take action that we know is going to make change right now and that we shouldn't have to to hope for uh and that we shouldn't have to be in a position where people can make excuses for their behavior because they might define hope in a way that's different from what my colleagues have just <laughs> said about you know how they define hope that's a really nice i place. think we should qualify that hope should be a verb hope is a verb Hope is a verb, hope is an action. Yes. Yeah, and it's something that connects us to the past and the future in ways that are profound. And that's actually kind of where we started this conversation. Um, I wanna thank all of you, we're at time. Um, this was, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, your wisdom, thank you for being courageous, thank you for saying difficult things. Um, and I hope <laughs> and will act towards um, continuing to work on doing this work. Um, I want to invite everyone um, who's tuned into this session um, to participate in the breakout discussions that are later. And I hope that I hope that in those breakout discussions, you're able to build on and extend some of what started here. So thank you very much and have a lovely rest of the day.